If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. We're going to speak on the subject tonight of miracles still happen. Miracles still happen. If you're taking notes, outline number one, Peter was arrested. Of course, we pretty much know why he was arrested for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, the church began to pray. And folks, I, I cannot tell you how important prayer is in a church. It is so, so vitally important, and we'll be talking about that in just a minute. Then number three, God's, God answers their prayers. Folks, God always answers prayers. Okay, he hears every one of your prayers. Not be may not be what you want, all right, but I promise you he does answer prayer. Father, thank you for this night, and thank you for your written word. And God, I just pray, Lord, that uh, we would just uh, uh, look at your word tonight, and I pray that we would realize that miracles still happen. And God, I just thank you for just biblical examples. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for real-life examples also. Uh, God, you have worked in a lot of people's lives, and God, I pray that we would just understand how much uh, prayer means uh, to a growing Christian. So God, be with the Scripture reading and be with our thoughts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Miracles still happen. Number one, Peter was arrested. Uh, Acts 12, verse 1, Now about the time of Herod, the king stretched out his hand, to harass some of the church. And this Herod was the grandson of the Herod uh, that uh, killed the babies during Jesus' time. And when you just see the word Herod, you can just, um, you can just figure that uh, all of them uh, were murderers. Uh, all of them uh, were not good people. And so, uh, you know, this, this thing that was going on in Acts chapter 2 and the growing of the church and really, one of the reasons uh, he was uh, arresting them was to please the Jews. He wanted the Jews to be on his side. And so that's why this harassment was going on. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And uh, by the way, James was the first uh, Christian martyr. And uh, it was John's brother uh, who, who, again, was very close to Jesus. It said, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. And the reason he seized Peter was because he was the leader of the disciples, and he was uh, one of the leaders of the New Testament church. So he thought, and uh, you know, and, and it, is, it, it is a strategy. If you take out, take out one of the head guys, then other people will fear and uh, possibly uh, quit doing what they were doing. And basically, again, they were just sharing the gospel with people, and people were getting saved. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread, uh, which just tells you about the Passover. And during that time, uh, the, you know, he, he wouldn't do anything out of respect to the Jews. And we all know the Passover in the Old Testament was, you know, the getting out of Egypt, and uh, that's very important. And by the way, we will be doing uh, the Lord's Supper this Sunday, and I'm very excited about that. I love when we do the Lord's Supper. Verse 4, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So he arrested him, he put him in prison, and you think about four squads, all right, that's four group of, so you four, you know, 16 people was basically guarding Peter. And why was that? Because if you'll look back in Acts chapter 5, an angel woke him up and he got out of prison. And, you know, uh, they were very upset with that uh, because they just thought, how did he do this? You know, we, we had guards there, but because he had already done this and an angel 
had let him out sooner, uh, the uh, Herod was just saying, well, there's no way. We'll, we'll put him in the far inner cell. We'll chain him to two guards right there with him. Then we'll put two more guard the doors and then two more sections uh, of people. So they literally would have to get by 16 people to get to Peter, which tells you what? It was even more of a miracle. All right, it's one thing for two people to be guarding you. But if there's 16 people guarding you, they thought, there's no way he's getting out of this prison. Listen to me, folks. God's got a way. <laughs> All right, if God wants you out of jail, you're getting out of jail. I don't care what they do. And so we just have to understand that uh, because of, uh, you know, the time, uh, they weren't going to try Peter right then. But I believe since he killed James, I think he had every, every intention of killing Peter also. All right, he was ruthless. The Herods would, you know, they, they, they would kill family if they thought the family uh, was against one of the kings. Uh, so I, in my opinion, he had a death sentence hanging over him. Hold your finger there and go to Psalms 34 with me. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, 15, the psalmist says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Folks, God sees everything we do. God knows everything that is going on in our lives. Okay? You know, nothing is hidden from him. He doesn't have to foresee the future. He is the future, all right? He knows everything. His ears are open to their cry. Our God hears every prayer that we pray. Doesn't matter what time of day we pray. Doesn't matter how desperate we are or, or you know, what we want. He hears our prayers. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So what does that tell you right there? Hey, God was against Herod, okay? Uh, you know, him killing James and then having that attention of killing uh, Peter, God was against him, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their trouble. And it doesn't mean that you can just pray a prayer and all your troubles will go away. What it's saying is God always makes a way. There's two problems with that in our lives. Number one, we're not patient, okay? If we don't get an answer to our prayers quickly, then we quit praying sometimes. And the other thing is we have to pray in faith. We need a strong faith, knowing that there is no situation in life that God can't handle, and knowing there's no situation in life God can't change. Doesn't mean it's like a Christmas list, and you make this list, and your parents buy you everything on that list. Okay, God is not Santa Claus. All right, but he, he, he is in control. He knows what he's doing. And I think a lot of the times we quit praying early because the prayers weren't answered uh, right away. And it says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. And again, brokenness, uh, fervent prayer, a consistent prayer, heartfelt prayer, praying where Literally, tears are falling from your face. Okay, that is serious praying. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And you say, well, what about these persecuted Christians in third world countries? What about when they were beheading Christians uh, several years ago? Well, folks, the, he did deliver them out of their trouble. Okay? If they were killed for the cause of Christ, number one, they get two crowns for sure, the martyr's crown and the crown of righteousness. And they will be with the Lord. They did, they were delivered from that. So it's just how you look at things. Look at verse 20. He guards all, he guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. And folks, you know, uh, they're going to get theirs one day, all right? Everyone's going to stand before God 
and give an account of what they did in life to God. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. The folks, uh, even, you know, where Peter was in jail and arrested and falsely accused and all that went on there, God knew what was going on, and God was in control of the situation. Now look at verse 5. The church begins to pray. Oh, folks, I believe prayer is one of the greatest privileges that we have as Christians. And I believe with all my heart, uh, I've had some friends come in and visit our church, or even some pastors ask me about a prayer list. And when I hand them our prayer list, they look at it like, are you kidding me? Okay, and, and I'm not just bragging all that. I'm just telling you how it is. Matter of fact, when we first started, it was a half sheet, one of the half sheets. And now you look at it front and back, and I mean, it is loaded. We cannot say we don't have anything to pray for. We have tons of things to pray for. So prayer is a privilege, and I thank God, uh, Tony, that we have a pray in church. I thank God for all of our prayer groups. We have a prayer group that meets on Saturday nights at 5 o'clock. We have a prayer group that meets on Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. Uh, a.m. We're going to finish this Bible study with prayer. Why? Because prayer works. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is getting the ear of God. Prayer is praying to the one who knows that, that, that we know he can change any situation in life. I really don't care what the doctor says, and I respect doctors. But folks, when God decides to do something, it really doesn't matter what the doctor said. I've even been in rooms where they said, you know, I'd seen this uh, one month ago, and it's just not here now. And I'm telling you, I love it when church members say, well, I know what happened, because the doctor will say, I don't know what happened. Well, I know what happened. God took it away. And folks, that's the importance of prayer, but constant prayer. And again, you know, you think in a 24-hour period, I look at the word constant. I believe they had 20, a 24-hour prayer for Peter. It doesn't say that. But folks, you got to look at every word in the Word of God, okay? They were on their knees. Their leader was in prison. Sixteen Roman trained guards were watching them. But folks, God had a plan. God always has a plan. And so we need to understand it is so important. And do you know when we really, when we pray the most? When we're in trouble. Can y'all agree with that? Just shake your head. A lot of times we pray, but our most intense prayers are when we're in trouble or something has gone awry. And folks, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says three words. Pray without ceasing. I tell you, uh, some of my best prayer time is in the middle of the night, folks. I'm just, when, when I wake up and I can't sleep, I literally pray till I fall back to sleep. Why? It's quiet. I can focus. And again, when you pray, or even how you pray is not the issue. The issue is we must be men and women of prayer. Prayer changes things. But you know what else I found, about, found out about prayer? Prayer changes me. Okay? Sincere, intent, focused prayer changes me. I am in tune with my heavenly Father. Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. And it's just one verse. Look at verse 10. Fear not. And I can show you in just, just a few minutes, Peter was not afraid. Okay? I, you know, being chained to folks in an innermost inner prison, with 16 people watching you, fear not. 
for I am with you. Do you realize, and I know you know this, there's never a time when God's not with you. Ever. Ever. Okay? Uh, it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. God is there with you. Be not dismayed. Don't worry. Don't be scared. Don't think it's an impossible situation. My Bible says with God, nothing is impossible. And we, we need to start praying. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I don't know about you, but when I'm in trouble and I'm in situations like that, of all the people, I mean, I love it when my wife holds my hand. But man, I'm telling you, when things turn awry, it's good to know that God is holding your hand. God is giving you strength. God calms your fear. And, and prayer is a part of that. Luke 22. Luke 22. Verse 39. And we know this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was about to die, folks. Okay, he was about to be arrested. He was about to go through the worst beating that a man could take. And the Bible says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, which meant he was there a lot and he prayed a lot. Think about that. Most of the big things that Jesus did, the big miracles, you can find that he went alone or went with his disciples to what? To pray pray as is a custom and his disciples also followed him and when he came to the place he said to them pray that you may not enter into temptation well what kind of temptation is he talking about folks i'm just telling you not taking it serious enough prayer is a serious thing and when you get in sincere and fervent prayer it's labor folks there's been times that i've prayed and it was intense and i got up think and I just work for an hour. Okay. And I may not have prayed. I might have prayed 20 minutes. Okay. So he's saying, don't be distracted. Turn everything off. Get alone with God. Get on your knees. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and, knelt down and prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The key to getting answered prayer is praying in God's will. You say, how will I know that? Folks, if you get an intense prayer, you're going to know that. The Spirit, Romans 6, or Romans 8, 26, the Spirit intercedes for us. The Spirit shows us how to pray. The Spirit gives us that wisdom that we know what the answer is to what we're praying for. But nevertheless, it wasn't that Jesus was afraid. It wasn't that, you know, you know take it away. He, he was simply saying, I know what I'm fixing to go through. And if there's any other way, folks, he felt every nail that went in his hand. He felt the crown of thorns that was on his head. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Folks, God has a perfect will for your life. God has a plan for your life. And it's hard sometimes to pray, especially with sickness and when someone is even near death, for God's will to be done. But I'm telling you, it is the right thing to pray according to the word of God. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. Have you noticed angels hang around God's people? <laughs> Have you noticed that? And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And it's been, it's been proven that you can do this. It, you can be so intense about something that you'll pop blood vessels in your sweat gland. That's how sincere, that's how passionate, that's how fervent Jesus 
was pray. And when he rose up from prayer, he had come to his disciples and found them sleeping. Folks, I'm telling you, again, I pray myself back to sleep, but I'm simply saying, boy, there's times where you need to stay with it. There's times when it needs to be intense. And, and intercession prayer is work. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So we see Peter arrested. We see the church begins to pray. And number three, God answers their prayers. Look at verse six. And when Herod was about to bring him out, okay, that he was going to do that the next day. That night, Peter was asleep, bound with two chains between two soldiers. The guards were before the door and were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. A light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side, side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. You think Peter was worried about it? Oh, he was getting some Z's. He was at peace. Live or die. I'm good. All right? God's taking care of me. Herod doesn't decide my fate. God does. So what did he do? He fell into a deep sleep. If a bright light didn't wake him, if you know people uh, with chain two didn't awake him, all right, he was in a deep sleep, and his chains fell off his hand. Well, maybe they didn't just put those chains on tight enough. Maybe there was an earthquake like there was at other places. No, folks, God can do anything. Chains will not bind Jesus, okay? When he wants you out, you're going to get out. Doesn't matter. And then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie your sandals. Why would he say that? Because you're, 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 you're going. You're not coming back, okay? The stuff that you wear, you get it on. Put your, put your clothes on. Put your cloak on. Put your shoes on. You're getting out of here. And it says, so he went out and followed him, it did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And he literally thought that he might have been in a dream. Okay? And folks, I've dreamed stuff that seemed real. I mean, when I, when I wake up from a dream like that, I'm looking around trying to figure out, did I dream this or is this real happening? Okay? So I've been there, and I think you have too. And when they were past the first and second guard post. They came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them on its own accord. Not somebody there unlocking, not somebody having the key, not somebody taking the chain off. All right? The angel of God was going to get Peter all the way out into a safe place. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Oh, folks, you, you need to believe an angel. Okay, God has a guardian angel for every Christian. And when he needs more than one, I'm telling you, he can call more than one angel. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. He is saved. God saved my life. God did it. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname is Mark, where many were gathered together praying. They were still praying. There's no indication of how long they had been praying. It could have been a day. It could have been two days. It could have been three days for all we know. But we do know they had gathered together Folks, I'm telling you, this is how old prayer meetings are. And I've said this. Uh, I know, you know, what we do on Wednesday night is kind of old and traditional. But folks, it works. Prayer works. Okay? Verse 13, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came and answered. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. She had heard Peter speak before, 
Peter had probably been in John Mark's mom's house many times. And so she heard him and said, that is boys. And she got so excited, she didn't even open the door. She just ran to tell everybody what was going on. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Let me tell you this in modern language. You're crazy, girl. You're out of your mind. We know where he is. We know he's in the inner part of the jail. We know there is no way that's Peter. And it said, it, she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. And again, you know, uh, you know there's all kinds of angels, but they were just trying to think of how this could be, how this could be. Now, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I want to ask you this question. If they had spent 24 hours or 36 hours in prayer, and they were praying for Peter's protection, why would they be astonished? <laughs> Anybody, have you ever thought of that? Why are we surprised when God comes through or God does this or God does that? Folks, I am telling you, I still say one of the key to praying is praying in faith. Not my faith that makes it happen, but it's faith in a God that can make it happen. Folks, our God can do anything. Okay, he can take somebody that has had a cancer diagnosis and the doctor's saying, there's really nothing we can do about it. And I'm telling you, he can heal that person from cancer. He can take somebody that's been in a terrible wreck. Did we not see this right over here before our eyes? And think, this girl ain't going to live. But yet, weeks later, she's sitting in our service, and she's worshiping with us. Oh, God can do anything. He can do anything. Why were they astonished? Okay? But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. So he got to tell the story. Boy, don't you know that was an exciting story? Can you imagine how fired up the Christians got? Yeah, he said, yeah, I'm just laying here and two guys beside me and some angel kicks me in the fit and says, hey, get up, wake up. Can you imagine being there and listening to Peter tell that story? I'm telling you, it was so exciting. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Mark 10, 27. Mark 10, 27. The Bible says in Mark 10, 27, but Jesus looked at them. And again, he was talking to the disciples and, you know, they were just, you know, they, they weren't getting it. You know, why is it so hard for a rich man to be saved? And I can tell you why, because they have put their trust in money and not in God. And then he uses the, you know, the eye of a needle and, you know, a camel to go through an eye and needle. And, you know, you take that symbolically, folks, there's no way a camel can go through an eye of a needle. But that's not the point. The point is, from man's point of view, it can't happen. But from God's point of view, it can happen. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but with God, or with God, all things are possible. Well, God has taken a lady that has just wrecked her life and had been on drugs for years and years, and God intervenes, and God comes into her life, and God saves her. And now she's working at a drug and rehab place. I can, I can tell you and show you a lady, that's exactly what happened here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. God can take a man that has drunk his whole life and drank his whole life 
and he comes face to face with God. He has tried every program there is in the world, but yet he gets freed up. And here's what I'm saying, and I believe this is what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, folks, I can do anything. Salvation is the greatest miracle of all. See, we look at the Red Sea partying and we think, you know, that, you know I wish I'd have been there. That is unbelievable. And, and it was. I mean, it would be, again, I'm, I'm hoping God has this huge screen up there and we get to see it all like it was live. I'd love to see that. But I'm simply saying, every time somebody gets saved, it's a miracle. God took someone that was bound to hell, and God rescued them, and God saved them. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Ooh, I'm in verse, I'm in 41. Let me get to the right one. Don't you hate it, hate it when you mark the wrong <laughs> scripture? <laughs> Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, and he has sent me to heal the broken heart. Folks, first and foremost, we need to be sharing the gospel with people around us. But we also need to be comforting people, sharing, healing the brokenhearted. Oh, there are so many brokenhearted people in society. And just to stop and just to stop. And, and when you see somebody crying, folks, I know it's super hard for some of you to do this. But just to stop and say, hey, can I pray for you? Folks, I'm telling you. The greatest prayer warrior that I ever met personally was Dino Hutchins. That dude prayed for everyone everywhere. Okay? I bought his motorcycle, and we had r rode together some, and, you know, before he got cancer and all this was going on. And I'm telling you, if we would stop at a gas station and get gas, he'd ask the clerk, man, do you know Jesus? Or if he just says, he would just literally say to somebody, I mean, like somebody getting out of the car, is there something I can pray for you about? Okay? And folks, I know most of us are not like that, but we can be. Okay? It's a choice that we make. And I personally believe that praying is one of the easiest things that we can do. All right? So, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And folks, there are a lot of people, I, I understand the literal prison here, but there are a lot of people that are in prison, okay? They're in prison uh, with their past. They're in prison with a, a habit. They're in prison with, and you can fill in the blanks there, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Well, folks, man. We need to be men and women of prayer. We need to be in our own prayer closet. But I believe we also need to be men and women outside of our prayer closet, praying for people when, uh, you know, it's just like in the hospital. You know, it doesn't happen all the time. But if I see someone in the hallway standing outside a room and crying, I'll ask, kid, I pray for you. Do you know not one of them has ever turned me down? Not one of them has said, I don't want your prayer. And I'm sure sooner or later that's going to happen. But folks, praying for people, praying for situations is so important. My challenge tonight to you, I just want to challenge you in this month to pray for a Christmas miracle for someone. Pray for a Christmas miracle for someone. Can I make two suggestions tonight? Bonnie Stout and Pixie King. 
two that we can pray for that need a miracle. And there's many, many more. I'm not just picking them out of our prayer list. They just come to mind. And there's others. There's other people you work with. There's other people you know. There's family situations. There's, and folks, God is still in the miracle business. Father, I thank you for prayer. God, I thank you that as soon as we finish praying here, we're going to break down in group and pray. God, I pray that we would sense a person and you would lay on everybody's heart that we're going to pray for a Christmas miracle. And God, we're not putting a time on you. We're not saying you have to do it. But God, if it's your will, God, we pray this in faith, believing with all our heart, you can do it. God, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you that even when you look at the Acts 2 New Testament church, part of that second chapter was that they were praying together. Later on in other chapters, they were praying so intense that the ground shook, that they were so just tuned into you, God, that the Holy Spirit just took over prayer meetings. So God, I know with all my heart how important prayer is. So God, I just pray that we would be men and women of prayer. Thank you for our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. God, we give you these situations in life. And God, I know we have other personal ones that we can pray for. So God, I pray that we would be faithful, persistent, consistent, fervent, and focused in our praying for a Christmas miracle. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.